Hey Tech Policy Grind, this is Emery, here to let you know that all this week we'll be releasing some very special bonus episodes of Tech Policy Grind. Last week, Joe and I found ourselves at State of the Net 2018, the largest internet policy conference in the country, hosted by our parent organization, the Internet Education Foundation. Throughout the day, we got to talk to some incredibly interesting people doing work at the very edges of internet policy. Today, we'll start things off with our first discussion of the day, where we were joined by James Besson and Charles Dwan to talk about the implications of automation, robotics, and the economy. James Besson is the executive director of the Technology and Policy Research Initiative at Boston University School of Law, and Charles Dwan has a title that's long enough that I'll just leave to Joe to introduce properly at the beginning of the interview. Suffice to say that Charles is an attorney at Public Knowledge and an incredible writer and thinker on some of the fascinating issues facing law and technology today. We are so thrilled to be trying out something a little new here at Tech Policy Grind, and we can't wait to hear what you think. So sit back, relax, or continue to drive, or do whatever you were doing previously, this is podcasting after all, and enjoy our discussion with Charles Dwan and James Besson at State of the Net 2018. Hey everyone, this is Emery here with Tech Policy Grind in DC at the State of the Net conference. This is the Internet Education Foundation's 14th annual State of the Net, the largest internet policy conference in the country. We're sitting here with Joe as uh, well as our excellent guests, Charles Dwan and James Besson. Joe, do you want to introduce our guests a little bit better? So we've got uh, James. Uh, he is the executive director at the Technology Policy and Research Initiative at Boston University School of Law. Uh, I used to go to BU, so go Terriers. Um, and then we have Charles Duan, who has another mouthful of a title, the <laughs> associate director of tech and innovation policy at R Street. Um, R Street is an organization that CET works pretty closely with, so we're happy to have them both here. Great to be here. So we were actually, before we started recording, having a really great conversation about artificial intelligence and what it means for, I guess, the future of work or the future of all of us having jobs. Um, so I guess, you know what, James, I'll start with you. Are the robots coming for our jobs? It, good question. There's, I, I think many people think we're, you know, they're approaching this as sort of the, what's called the robot panic. People are worried that we'll be out of work, and some people are predicting that in 10 or 20 years, 47% of all occupations will be at risk of automation. Poppycock, I say. Uh, <laughs> Is that because your job won't be at risk? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be ri I'll, I won't be working there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the, the story is this. In the, in the next 10 or 20 years, uh, artificial intelligence robots are going to be very disruptive to our society, but it's not because they're going to be eliminating jobs on the whole. Uh, when you think about automation, people automatically assume that automation means uh, jobs will be lost. Uh, and that's not necessarily true. D automation can create jobs. And in fact, you know, if, you, if you look historically, we, we tend to think about manufacturing. And you, know, you, you look from the mid 20th century, the number of manufacturing jobs has declined dramatically. In 1940, there were over 400,000 textile workers in the US. Uh, today, there are something like 16,000 dramatic drop and most of that is due to technology. Some of it to global trade, but most of it to technology. What we forget, however, is that for the hundred years prior to that, from the early 19th century, a heavy rate of automation was accompanied by strong job growth. We didn't get to 400,000 textile workers except because the automation that was put in place then was creating jobs. And we're seeing the same sort of thing now. You, now, you, you, So there's a question, what, well, why is that? How, why did things change? You know, and, and, and will they, you know, what, what do we face today? Um, and the reason has to do with demand for the product. So back in the early 19th century, the average person had one set of clothes. And when the price of cloth went down because of automation, they bought a bunch more. They bought a lot more. And so if you look over the 19th century, they increased their, the per capita consumption of cloth went, over, went, up, went up over tenfold, almost twentyfold. Um, that meant that the demand for cloth ex, you know, was growing faster than the labor saving sure. effect of the automation, and so the net number of jobs went up. You come to the mid 20th century and everybody's got lots of clothes, the closet's full of clothes. They're using cloth uh, draperies, cloth upholstery, and Automation is still chugging along, bringing productivity benefits, but now there's not much more demand that it, that it brings about. And as a result, the labor saving effect dominates and jobs are reduced. Okay. But it, it's a long arc of history to think about. Look today at what's happening. The question is, are these new technologies going into areas where there's large pent up demand that's not being met? Mm. And in lots of areas, particularly the service economy, finance, healthcare, 
there is lots of pent up demand. And so what you see, my favorite example is the bank teller and the ATM. Uh, everybody has assumed that the automated teller machine would come in and, and eliminate the bank teller. So between 1995 and 2005, you had this huge influx of almost half a million ATM machines. And what happened to the bank tellers? Their, their jobs actually went up. So can I push yeah. back against that for a second? Because yep. that's a common anecdote that I've heard over and over again about the bank. I think Google, it, it, Google's Eric Schmidt used that. Well, it, I'm the guy who oh. came oh, up oh, with oh, it. Oh, oh, <laughs> the author. So I guess my understanding is you're right. Like the demand goes up, more and more jobs, but then eventually something tails off. And right. I was looking at statistics. I think the, uh, the Bureau of Labor suggests that bank tellers are actually supposed to decrease by you know 2024, and then moving down. Yeah, th th the ATM wasn't the only machine that's affecting bank tellers. I mean, you're okay. talking mm -hmm. uh, the um, you know the BLS projections. Uh, sometimes they're right, and sometimes they're not. And they, they've you know there there's some very famous cases where, where they've been wrong. But, uh, you know, so you have online banking is affecting the banking industry sure. in numerous of ways. The, the, but uh, the, I think the, the, the main point is we're seeing lots of technologies. Some of them are going to eliminate jobs. Many of them are actually going to be creating jobs. Uh, so, so what why? type of jobs? Yeah. What, 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 what should we all be doing? <laughs> it, it, it saved me. First off, it's going to be in, in sectors where there is large on pent up demand. It's um, it's going to be more in the service sector than in manufacturing, for instance. So we're you know the, the the effect of robots is not necessarily going to increase jobs. It's probably more likely decreasing jobs. I mean, we see we see, we see in our empirical work evidence that that's the pattern. That so that which technologies are we likely to see? reach that sort of escape velocity where it's creating more jobs than destroying. Yeah, I think you're seeing lots lots of things in finance, in healthcare, um, in the service sector where that's that's the case. Um, Charles, do you have anything? Well, so you know, I'm a lawyer, so you know, um, automation of the law has always been something that's very interesting to me. And I know that you've used um, the law as an example in yeah. terms of discovery, um, where the fact that we started automating some of the discovery processes means that we can actually do law more efficiently, which means that people can hire more lawyers um, because you know the cases are less costly to, to prosecute or to defend. Um, and I think there are a lot of really interesting opportunities in that area, at least, mm -hmm. um, where you know. You don't have so much um, computers taking over the jobs of lawyers, but you have computers assisting lawyers. You have computers working together with lawyers. And there's a huge demand there. I mean, yeah. we the, the legal gap is larger than ever exactly. before. Exactly. Right I now. mean, you know, right now we're facing a situation where legal services are incredibly expensive and you know really only reachable by you know big companies or you know very wealthy people, and the opportunities for combining automation processes with um, with you know human services. Um, I think really democratize the process and allow people to get more involved in the legal system in ways that they haven't before. I've seen a lot of you know attempts at you know for example building systems for fighting parking tickets, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I think okay. that's yeah. So things like that Joshua I think are really good examples cool of there. where automation can work with um, human input. Um, in ways that, that are really effective. Um, you know, I think one of the other areas that we're looking at that's interesting is, um, is customer service, right? Where, you know, when we're facing new technologies, they're not easy to use a lot of the times. And we're going to need a lot of people to, you know, help figure out just how these are going to work. Really? Um, I, mean, I think that's going to be a pretty big, I think that's going to be a fairly big industry. Can um, I push back on that yeah. a little though? Because I mean, I feel like, I have gone through periods of my life where I needed to sit down for hours and try to teach my grandparents or my parents how to check email. But today, with smartphones, you know, you know, my dad will take photographs as he's driving, which is insane. I mean, this is, you know, also unsafe. Unsafe, yes, dad, this is for you. Please stop doing that. Um, I I feel like the ethos of design is seeping into technology so much that we, we're not really seeing the situation where the technology is getting more difficult to use. If anything, it feels like it's getting easier. Sure, sure. I think that in a lot of situations, it is getting easier in terms of just consumer products. Mm. Um, but, you know, for example, I have to spend, you know, hours on um, on the phone talking to Com or waiting for somebody to talk to on Com at Comcast, right? Mm. Um, I think that there are a lot of opportunities for improving that system. That's never going to be a fully automated system, right? We're always going to want to have a human there. The first thing I do when I call most of these call centers is I say, you know, give me an operator, give me a real person, right? We need a real person. Press the zero button yeah, exactly, until it transfers exactly. you through the operator. <laughs> so, you know, I think there are, you know, there are a lot of situations where, you know, we expect a person or, you know, having a person there is really helpful. But 
there's a lot that automation can do to help that process, to make it faster, to make it more efficient, to make it more uh, more effective with you know fewer people, or to get more people involved. Um, you know, similar. It's it's similar to the way that that um, any of these ride sharing systems work. By getting more people into the system and developing better algorithms, you know, we're not necessarily immediately displacing jobs. We're just connecting people to the jobs more efficiently. I think that's a really important aspect that automation can help um, help with. So I think I might be burying, burying the lead here a bit. Um, you guys are both going to be on the very first breakout panel of the day on artificial intelligence. I think it's uh, about the broadest topic header of any of the presentations today. So do you want to <laughs> talk a little bit about what your panel presentation is on today or what, what are the topics you're drilling down into? Yeah, sure. So, you know, um, so James talked a lot about um, kind of the, the implications of of, of automation and AI for the future of work. Um, so, you know, I think we'll be talking a lot about that. Um, one of the areas that we're very interested in is um, the use of artificial intelligence in the government and particularly in the criminal justice system. This mm. has been a very hot topic recently. Um, in is it going well? I gotta interrupt because I feel like I have strong personal Is it going well in, yeah. like in the criminal justice system? Do, well, I guess. <laughs> well, I, I'm curious. Let's let's. Maybe this is too strong of an ideological question, but do you think? I, I th imagine there's lots of utility for automation in criminal justice. My initial impulse is that people think it's doing a lot of harm, and at the same time, advocates seem to seem to be suggesting that it's it's just better than the status quo. Yeah. So, you know, I think that they're, they're sort of the promise and the reality here, right? Okay. The promise is great, right? Theoretically, we can have these systems that avoid all sorts of human bias problems. They can be very transparent. We can figure out exactly how they work. They can be based on scientific principles rather than, you know, I'm sentencing you to, you know, 20 years because I had a bad breakfast this morning. Um, there are studies on that sort of thing. So there's a lot of promise there. There's, you know, right now the state of things is that the technology is much more primitive than what we can imagine. Um, a lot of the um, sentencing algorithms or the pretrial algorithms that are in use today are just checklists. They're just numbers. They're on the level of a credit score. Um, they're not the sort of you know complicated AI prediction, um, you know human level analysis that that you know we imagine in our heads sometimes. Um, and so I think that's been pretty limiting. And the other problem is that a lot of the companies are very secretive about how these algorithms work. And the secrecy, you know, I think number one has been a big problem for innovation in the field because you don't have the sort of information sharing among researchers um, in terms of how some of these algorithms work. And it's been problematic because you don't end up with the, um, you know, with the sort of the sort of fighting between parties that ultimately makes these sorts of things more fair and more understandable um, or better for the system overall. So you know, I think that there's a lot to be said for transparency in these sorts of systems. And once we start getting to that point, I think that we'll, you know, we'll start seeing systems um, used within the criminal justice system and in other places in government um, that are really effective. But right now, the, um, you know, the opaqueness of the system, I think, has been really harmful. James, I'd like to turn to you quickly. So we were talking, trans we we're talking about a little bit of the theme of transparency here. What does that impact? What does that mean in terms for competition? Uh, we were discussing earlier that a lot of industries, with, with regard to artificial intelligence, are being dominated by key players, and not just the big tech companies, but in every vertical, there's a couple of competitors, and then everyone right, fighting right. for scraps. Yeah, we're seeing this throughout the developed world that the the top companies in each industry are able to utilize IT and. Uh, better than anybody else. And so they're able to become more productive, they're able to grow faster, they're getting greater market share, they're earning higher profits, uh, and this is upending things in, in lots of ways. Not necessarily a bad problem. Uh, I, th I think it's misunderstood. So we're seeing this rise of industry concentration in people, or rising profits, uh, and some people assume, well, that means that we're having less competition and maybe the antitrust authorities have been too lax in their enforcement. Our evidence seems to be saying, no, it's, it's not because of, overall, this trend is not because of uh, lax enforcement. Lax enforcement might still be a problem, but that's not what's driving this trend. Uh, it's, it's really technology. That's so it, does, does, do things like algorithmic transparency help that, or is it just these companies have so much scale? That so it's about data. This is what it's about. It, it, uh, algorithmic transparency or, you know, we're putting algorithms into place and you think about the role of regulation or about of third party insurers or others who can justify for the reliability or safety or unbiasedness mm -hmm. of these various algorithms. And in order to do that, you need the data. 
it, this, is a, this is a big difference. Regulation today requires expertise. Regulators rely on experts who can, if I want to judge the safety of an automobile, say, I can get a, you know, engineers in there and we can do some tests on how fastly it breaks and, and we understand that if it breaks in, in 100 yards and under these conditions in the test lab, it's going to do so in conditions throughout highways across America. With something like self-driving automobiles, we have this machine learning technology that learns things, but it doesn't, you don't have that same uh, portability because it's not based on theoretical science, it's based on machine learning. So uh, machines can recognize stop signs, but they don't always recognize stop signs the same way you and I do. So there are, uh, computer scientists have these examples where they can show a stop sign that you and I would say, yes, that's a stop sign, uh, but the machine will think it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we had a fatality a couple years ago, and apparently it was because uh, a Tesla car on autopilot mistook a, a trailer truck crossing the road for an overhead sign. You and I wouldn't make that distinction. And th those things are going to happen. They may happen very rarely, but the problem is in order, th the point I'm trying to get at, which maybe it's a long and roundabout uh, <laughs> <It's quite laughs> story right. here, um, is that in order for insurance companies or government regulators to judge the safety of these new systems, they have to have a lot of data. Okay. They either have to have the cars driven for, Rand estimated that they needed hundreds of billions of miles of driving in order to really evaluate their safety, or you have to provide the data in some other way so that mm -hmm. these third parties or government parties can, can analyze it. And, and, and where the data is private, that, you know, that, that's an issue. In a large well, Jake, so, so one, one thought that comes to, comes to mind from that is it sounds like data is very important, but also testing is very important, right? Yeah, yeah. I wonder if, you know, this suggests that there's actually an industry for um, developing AI testers, either, you know, automated ones or human ones who will, you know, come up with the, word, the weird edge cases and figure out, yeah. you know, okay, let's yeah. make sure that, you know, this AI doesn't mistake the truck for, the, uh, for a stop sign or something. Yeah, like we, we, we n basically we're going to need a whole set of new institutions. I mean, we're going to need new rules for sharing the data so that we can have those testers do their mm -hmm. work, but we're going to need a new set of institutions and new ways of doing regulation because of this, I think. How likely do you think it is that we will rise to that challenge? Oh, I think we'll do it. I, it's just a question of how painful it will be to get yeah. there. Well, you <laughs> want to put on some prognostic hats <laughs> yeah. and uh, let's think about well, how I mean, painful I mean, this we is have some be, examples of that painful. already, right? Yeah. A lot of, you know, the, the folks in the, in the cybersecurity field, right, they right. do this sort of thing all the time. You know, the companies yeah. will hire people just to press buttons randomly on phones to see if the phone will break or, you know, reveal any secrets unintentionally. So, you know, I think that there's a burgeoning field of this already, at least within the cybersecurity field, and, you know, bringing that out to more general manufacturing and use of AI and all sorts of different fields, I think, will be important. But, um, you know, the seeds of that are already there. Now, one of the difficulties, of course, is that cybersecurity is a pretty young field as well, right? And so we haven't brought that down to the point of, you know, science, right? right. It still, you know, still requires a lot of training um, to be able to understand how some of those systems work. So I think that, you know, there's going to be some development, some education, and some creativity required before we get to the point of, you know, developing the institutions and, you know, getting all the data and making sure that we have the system in place to test these sorts of things, but you know, we're, the seeds are there. And, and it should be said that AI itself may will be helpful in developing these mm -hmm. systems, so that we can have AI machines testing other AI systems. And then we get into the <laughs> the really scary zone where I mean, it starts to to the extent that machines can can train against other machines. Uh, you're still involving, uh, you know, very limited domains. Mm -hmm. You're still requiring, you know, human guidance. Uh, in order to, to set that up, um, the, the the you know the great difficulty about uh, machine learning is that it it can do very well with very well focused data. Uh, it it's it's not able to take an ab a model of abstraction. I mean, the, the the reason that engineers can test brakes on car systems is that we have a you know models of of mechanical engineering and, and physics that tell us how these things work and we can take that model and apply it. We know it applies generally. Here, we're, we're with machine learning, we just, those systems don't have models. They don't have the abstraction. And so they may identify a face, but they have no idea what the back of the head will look like. Whereas I can look at Charles and make a pretty good guess what the back of his head looks like. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs>
<laughs> to turn around a second. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice yeah. For, for our listeners here, uh, Charles has actually um, several letters cut into the back of his <laughs> um, and, and an illustration of like a, a, a gavel. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, I, I think though, you know, one of the other interesting things is, um, is, is the communication between systems, um, which I think as we've seen in the computer field has been much more difficult than, than sort of we would assume. You know, we just sort of assume that, you know, like one, one AI system is gonna be able to talk to this other AI system and that, you know, my inner of things system in the house is gonna communicate with my car and like everything's gonna be able to communicate. Um, this has turned out, at least in existing technology, to be much harder than we expect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and this is this is kind of a problem of what you know what we call interface compatibility. That in order for you know one computer system to talk to another computer system, they both have to speak the same language. But the companies who develop these systems have very strong incentives to make their languages hard to be spoken by other people because that you know maintains the market dominance within um, within their small field, um, ensures that you know you have to buy their products. Um, and so, at least in recent years, that's meant that there's been a lot of human involvement required just for translating between systems and developing those sorts of glue pieces um, that allow, you know, my my smartphone to talk to my, I don't know, my, my door or something like that. Um, I think that that's going to continue to be a problem until we start seeing companies who are really willing to, you know, take advantage of open standards um, and develop compatible interfaces. And, you know, like I said, companies have strong incentives not to do that. Hmm. Um, so I think that at least for the time being, until, you know, we somehow overcome that, um, that sort of internal incentive. To oh, cough, cough, regulation, <laughs> cough, cough. <laughs> It's it's going to be a while before we really start seeing that that sort of ability of you know systems to train each other mm. because they're just not going to be able to talk to each other. Companies don't have the incentives to um, allow their systems to do that. All right. Well, Charles and uh, James, your panel starts in I believe twenty five minutes or so. So I want to thank both of you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to um, maybe leave one final thought, or if you have maybe a uh, <laughs> what do you think is you know this is state of the net twenty eighteen. So I mean, what is the biggest challenge we're facing specifically this year short term for AI? You know, I mean, there. I, I think one of the things is that um, there's just so much to imagine at this point in terms of AI. You know, we have these visions of, you know, driverless cars that know exact and, you know, AI systems that know exactly what we want. Um, and it's very tempting to be scared of those sorts of things. Technology isn't there. It's going to be a long time before we get there, I think. And really, when we're, when we're talking about regulation, we're talking about, you know, do we need to worry about robots taking over the future? I think it's, it's worth just remembering, you know, the technology, it's, it's going to be a long time before we get to the sorts of technologies that lead to the fears that a lot of us like to bring up. Um, right now, most of the technologies um, in machine learning or AI that we're talking about are much simpler things that you know, are, work, are still requiring humans to work with them. Um, so you know, I think that some of these fears of you know, automated systems that are going to just destroy all jobs um, or things like that, they're, they're much further away than I think we, we imagine them to be. <laughs> I'll, I'll make the same point from a different perspective, which is uh, what we're going to experience over the next 10 or 20 years really isn't going to be very different from what we've experienced already. Because we are already experiencing a high degree of computer automation. Uh, we've, the first AI systems were put into the field in 1987 for doing credit card fraud. We've been seeing automa computer automation of, of all sorts since the 1950s. The first fully automated uh, loan system was, I believe, 1972. These, we've been doing this for a long time, and if you think about automation more generally, we have 200 years of fairly intense automation in many industries. So we've had these fears periodically. There, there's a cycle of, <laughs> of, of fear oh, you know, over and over again. You, you can look back in the 60s, in the 30s, in the 19th century, where people were raising these very same issues and very, you know, very same fears. Uh, I'm not saying that things are going to be exactly the same as they were in the past, but at least for the next 10 or 20 years, we're seeing a lot more continuity than discontinuity. Um, that's not to minimize the fact that these are disruptive. I think we're already seeing effects in terms of uh, growing economic inequality, for instance, related to, to technology, or uh, growing industry concentration related to technology. These things are 
in the data so far that we see, uh, but it hasn't been the end of the world either. Thank you, gentlemen. I hope we gave you an opportunity to preview what you're going to be talking about in half an hour. Yeah, that's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. Thanks so much. This was great. Yeah, Thanks. it was fun. Hold on. Wait. Your mic. Uh